Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Jewish Gen Talk. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes, but in the meantime, uh, let us know in the chat where you are logging in from. We'd love to see uh, where you are in the world. Good afternoon to everyone who's logging in. Uh, welcome to, do, to today's Jewish Gen Talk. We have a very uh, special webinar planned. Um, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes, but in the meantime, uh, let us know where you're logging in from. You can post a message in the chat um, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Okay, I, I see some messages here that the chat is disabled. Thank you for telling us. Let me see what happened there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, try it now, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. If you could let us know where you're from, where you're logging in from, uh, we'd love to see you. And okay, here we go. We have uh, people from Idaho and Los Angeles, Jerusalem, Sarah Weil, welcome. Uh, Caldwell, New Jersey, Judah Salomon, Dan Schneider, um, Karen Arani in Brooklyn, New York. We have Coventry, which is upstate New York, Minneapolis, um, Bob Arnold, John Backman, Beth Fine from Seattle, Patricia Fuller from the Simi Valley in California. Welcome. For everybody who's logging in, welcome to today's uh, Jewish Gen webinar. We'll get started in about one minute from now, but in the meantime, please uh, put a message in the chat and let us know where you're logging in from. We have Susan from Jacksonville, Florida. We have Karen from Muncie, New York. Uh, Vivian from Cuscob, Connecticut, if I pronounce that properly. Tamara Gilbert from Portland, Oregon. Uh, Susan from the Newport Coast in California. Western Pennsylvania, Jim Abrams, Leah Dankowitz from Walton, Massachusetts. Hello, Leah, one of our uh, Jewish Gen Fellows. Sheldon Altman from Valley Village in California. Phil Goldfarb from Tulsa, Oklahoma, our uh, lead moderator of the Jewish Gen Discussion Group. And some of you might know him from the weekly emails from the, the Jewish Gen uh, News Nosh. And uh, we have Montgomery, Pennsylvania, Englewood, New Jersey, Kay Miller, welcome. And okay, we're gonna get started. Welcome everyone to today's uh, Jewish Gen uh, talk. My name is Avram Grohl and I'm uh, privileged to oversee uh, Jewish Gen, which is the Jewish Genealogical Research Division of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. If you have never been to the museum, I uh, invite you to come. I would love to show you around. We are located in Lower Manhattan. You can email me anytime. Uh, today's talk is part of our ongoing a Jewish Gen Talk series of educational webinars. Uh, this series, this particular series is focusing on research in the United States, and it has been organized by Ellen Coet, who is our Director of, United, of US Research. You can learn more about Ellen's work by visiting usa.jewishgen.org. Um, Ellen is going to introduce the panelists and the discussion and, and what you will be learning, but I just wanna add a few notes before we begin. First of all, this session is being recorded and we will make it available on the Jewish Gen YouTube channel, uh, hopefully soon after the conclusion of the program. Uh, we will send a link via email once that's done and also post a message on the discussion group. Uh, alongside the link will be a registration link for the, our next webinar, along with a survey. If you could please fill that out, it would be very helpful for us as we try to plan future events. Um, second, if you'd like to ask questions, there is a Q&A on the bottom of the screen please feel free. We will try our best to answer questions towards the end. Please keep your questions uh, general in nature. Um, if you'd like to connect with each other and share where you're from or share success, um, you can use the chat, but please be mindful while the speakers are uh, going through the program. Uh, I have enabled the live transcription, so you should be able to see on the bottom of the screen if that is necessary. Um, and finally, I would just invite you to join our discussion group if you are not already on it. 
It's groups.jewishgen.org. It's a great place to keep track of programs such as this, when they're going to be scheduled, once the recordings are made live, other Jewish Gen news and announcements. So if you're not on them, I encourage you to please visit groups.jewishgen.org and subscribe today. So without further ado, I welcome all of you again, and I pass it over to Ellen Cohen. Uh, Ellen, you're uh, muted. Thank you, Avrami. As part of Jewish Gen Talk's webinar series on researching Jews in America, we welcome you today to an overview of American genealogy collections found at New York City's Center for Jewish History. As Avrami mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Jewish Gen YouTube channel. My name is Ellen Schindelman Coet and I am director of Jewish Gen's USA Research Division. Please visit the USA Research Division's website shown here, and I will put this URL into the chat. Our panel of experts today will provide an overview of collections held throughout the Center for Jewish History that focus on American Jews. The American Jewish Historical Society will be featured, as well as other collections found within YIVO, Leo Beck, and the American Sephardi Federation. You will hear about how to navigate materials found online and offline, including some collections also shared elsewhere, such as on Ancestry.com and JewishGen. Our panel are distinguished and include Melanie Myers, Moria Amit, and J.D. Arden. Melanie Myers is the Deputy Director and Chair of Collections and Engagement at the American Jewish Historical Society. Prior to joining AJHS in 2018, she was the Senior Manager for Reference and Outreach at the Center for Jewish History. She has worked with special collections in a variety of settings, including private, nonprofit, and academic institutions over her 20-year career in libraries and archives. She has also served as an instructor in library science programs, where she's taught a variety of classes, including special collections, librarianship, and history of the book. Melanie also serves on the Jewish Gen USA Research Division's Honorary Advisory Board. Moria Amit is the Senior Genealogy Librarian at the Center for Jewish History in New York. For over a decade, Moria has provided on-site and remote guidance to thousands of family history researchers of all ages, abilities, and levels of experience, Jewish and non-Jewish. She coordinates the Center's Family History Today monthly series of genealogy-themed public programs and is one of the co-hosts of Genealogy Coffee Break, the Center's popular tutorial video series on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. In addition, Moria is the creator and manager of the New York Historical Synagogues map, which we will put the URL to in the chat, which is a free online tool for Jewish genealogy and was awarded a grant from the IAJGS in 2019. She earned a master's degree in library and information science from Pratt Institute, and Moria has previously served on the IAJGS board of directors. J.D. Arden is the Reference and Genealogy Librarian at the Center for Jewish History and teaches for LIU Hutton House. He has previously taught at LIU Post School of Library and Information Science. He graduated with a master's from Pratt Institute's Information School and with a bachelor's from Brandeis University. He writes for the CJH blog and is one of the co-hosts of the video series Genealogy Coffee Break on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. JD is one of the instructors for the CJH Jewish Genealogy class, all in the Mishpacha. He brings training opportunities in sign language to CJH staff out of personal interest and to make their work more accessible. Welcome panelists. I'm gonna pass it over to Moria. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Ellen for your wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you, Avram, as well. I will uh, be right with you. Um, can I, um, let's see. Ellen, can you see my slides? Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so today 
we're going to be me, uh, Melanie Myers, and JD Arden will be speaking with you about American Jewish resources at the Center for Jewish History. Um, but before we even go into specific resources, I want to give you a little bit of background information about the Center for Jewish History. Uh, we are a Smithsonian affiliate institution. Uh, in one building, we have museum galleries and auditorium that hosts um, all sorts of events, a library reading room and genealogy center. And on top of that, we have the collections of five different uh, Jewish historical organizations um, listed here. I will not go into more detail on those collections because I will leave that to my colleagues further, up, further along in the presentation. Um, but just know that we are, uh, uh, as you see, we're on West 16th Street, one avenue from Union Square. And uh, there's all kinds of reasons to come to us, uh, as you can see. So speaking specifically about research now, we have one reading room that is shared by all of our partner collections or all of our partner organizations, sorry. Um, and that means that no matter um, where uh, a specific item comes from that you're interested in, it will, uh, it will come down to one place, uh, the central reading room. And so we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a bit. Um, uh, just a quick note, our reading room hours are currently Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and by appointment only. So, as I mentioned, uh, the reading room is our physical location for uh, researchers. The uh, single search or search.cjh.org is our online uh, portal for all of our partner organizations and including the uh, Genealogy Institute as well. So you can search for any uh, topic, person, place um, that you'd like to in the search box here. And then I strongly urge you to keep this uh, selected as Center for Jewish History Collections so that you can see all sorts of different resources that are available from our different partner organizations. There is um, a, a good amount of overlap between all five of them. And so I I wouldn't want you to, you know, select one and then potentially uh, miss out on other resources that might be of interest to you. And you'll hear more about how that works uh, a little bit later on. So, uh, so once you've found something that you'd be potentially interested in seeing, you have basically two choices. You either are, you know, are going to pl are planning to visit us in person, or you can't visit us in person, so you want to see these materials uh, from your home computer. So either way, you will start by creating a research account at the site libraryservices.cgh.org, which you can find a link to on this search.cgh.org page. And once you register for a research account, then you have the, the choice of either scheduling a reading room appointment and then requesting materials for that particular visit. Or if you're not able to come in person, you can request the digitization of items of interest. Um, so this is what that initial um, login page looks like. Um, and if you have not done research uh, at the center before, you will first click on where it says first time users and then go through the registration process. Once that is complete, you can log in, uh, click on the appointments tab on the uh, top menu of the of the website and uh, select a certain um, date and time that you'd like to come in. So let's say you're interested in coming in uh, to see a particular book. 
such as uh, this uh, from Ararat to Suburbia, the history of the Jewish community of Buffalo. So you would find, you would uh, do a search, let's say for Jewish community Buffalo. And as you can see, we have 19 different um, items that are related to those, to that topic. Um, so one of those items is this book here. And you, once you go into the catalog record, what all you need to do to request to see it is to click on this get it link, which is just to the left of the, the um, book information. And then once you, it takes you down to the get it section, you will click on request item. Okay, so it's pretty similar um, process if you want to request archival material. The only difference is that you'll need to use a finding aid. Um, for those of you who are not um, familiar with archival research, a finding aid is like the table of contents for an archival collection. Um, and I want to also emphasize that this is not a names index. So it will tell you um, how a particular collection is organized in terms of types of material or, or subjects. Um, but they generally do not have a list of every single name that is mentioned in the collection. Um, and why, uh, sorry, and why would you potentially want to see archival material? Um, because the Center for Jewish History has a vast amount of uh, papers that have been donated to us from individuals, from families, from organizations, uh, anywhere from uh, Jewish cultural organizations to political organizations, religious institutions, social organizations, uh, and so forth. So, um, so once you have, um, oh, sorry, I should, I'm going to just go back one slide. So once you've um, selected a I'm sorry, once you've decided you want to see a particular collection, you're going to select this links um, section here, and it'll take you to a link uh, to the finding aid. And you'll open that, and then you'll see something like this here on the left, the collection organization, which will tell you exactly how the collection is organized, usually in uh, a series of uh, numbers, and within each series, there are usually further subdivisions. So there might be a box uh, or a number of boxes within a series. There might even be boxes and then folder numbers underneath that. So keep in mind, this is all like expand. Each of these are expandable. Um, and also the most important thing to know is that from this finding aid, that's where you're going to be able to access anything that we have available online. So anything that has already been digitized, uh, you will find through a collections finding aid. And you'll see when you open a particular uh, folder or item that you will see a link like this that shows up uh, very prominently on the page. That's its view the folder and you click on that and then you can actually see these historical documents on your screen. Um, I'm just gonna go over this very briefly. When you use the finding aid, um, you want to uh, make sure that you determine which boxes and folders you want to see. So for example, if you're going to look at the records of the United Service for New Americans, the series that is most relevant to genealogy research is this quarter correspondence. And um, so within that, let's say I have an ancestor who uh, was helped by the United Service for New Americans um, and they settled in Aurora, Illinois. Um, so I would select that section. And then, um, then on the next page, you would see this information about where exactly um, that particular set of documents is stored in box one and folder one. And so that's what it would look 
like here, when you go to request the item, you need to specify the box number and the folder number. Um, I know this is a lot right now, so uh, I just want to say that you're welcome to ask us questions at any time. And also, we have a very handy uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, a handy genealogy coffee break episode on how to navigate archival finding aids uh, on, that is available on both Facebook and YouTube. And also, for those of you who can't come to the, re the reading room in person, if you find something that you um, really want to see, but um, unfortunately has not been digitized yet, you still have another option, which is to request photo duplication. Um, but be mindful that before you place a photo duplication request, check to see if the material has already been digitized because many collections have been either wholly or partially um, digitized already. Um, and that's something that's ongoing. So one, if you see something you know, today that, hasn't, that is not yet online, if you come back in a few months, it may be online. Um, so this is just an idea of the, what the pricing is like for photo, our photo duplication services. And you will receive a cost estimate uh, which you will need to approve before your request is even processed. And then you will also, from the same um, login that I showed you earlier, that is where you'll be able to view your um, uh, digitized pages once that uh, whole process is complete. Okay, uh, the Genealogy Institute. That is where uh, I am uh, based, as well as my colleague, J.D. Arden, who will be speaking in a minute. Um, we are uh, open Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., the same as the reading room hours. Uh, the difference is we are welcoming walk-ins. Um, so please feel free if you're walking around uh, downtown Manhattan, you want to stop by during, you know, during the usual business day, um, feel free to come by. You are also welcome to make an appointment though. Um, and that is similar to what I showed you before. Um, the only uh, thing that will be different is instead of selecting an appointment for the reading room, you will select an appointment for the genealogy institute. So why should you come visit us? Um, there are a number of reasons, but I've boiled it down to three. Um, we have a pretty vast collection of genealogy reference books, such as surname dictionaries and town encyclopedias, which you're welcome to browse freely. Um, we have we provide free access to a number of genealogy databases, including Ancestry and Fold3. And last but not least, we offer our expert research guidance and referrals to relevant collections at the center. So maybe you think that there uh, may not be anything for your family related to your family because you don't have anyone who's you know particularly famous or well known in your family, but we can show you that there might be other ways to uh, find information about your family or or the at, or um, or the place where they came from and the time period and the community. Um, they'll help sort of build a bigger picture of what your ancestor ancestors' lives were like. Uh, but we also have online resources. So um, as, as I've already mentioned, we have this genealogy coffee break series, um, which you can access on the Center for Jewish History's Facebook page or YouTube channel. This is this series uh, is, I don't know, I think, I think we have over a hundred different videos now, somewhere around that. Um, and they're on all kinds of topics in genealogy, um, Jewish and non-Jewish. And we've similarly also created a number of research guides, um, which you can browse by topic or country of origin at this website here, genealogyguides.cgh.org. And finally, we are offering Zoom chat with a genealogy librarian, which is an opportunity to speak with one of our librarians one-on-one -on -one, um, without even coming uh, in person. 
So all you need to do is email us at gi at cgh.org to schedule your 45 minute session. Okay, I will now turn it over to Melanie Myers to start uh, your overview of the American Jewish Historical Society. Okay, yeah, I think that's my cue. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, I'd also just like to say I had the privilege of working with both JD and Moria for many, many years. I've been in this building for 11 years and um, the genealogy department here is truly fantastic. And I, I really encourage everybody to check it out in person or virtually um, you know, as you can. So what is AJHS? So we are the oldest extant ethnic um, and cultural library or archive in the United States. We are the oldest of the five partners, um, but as I said, we are also the oldest um, of our kind, I say extant because uh, I'm a librarian and we're cautious. And uh, there may be some that were older than us, but they uh, they haven't lasted as long, shall we say. But um, we have been in continual operation since 1892 with uh, the same mission the entire time, which is to foster awareness and appreciation of American Jewish heritage and to serve as a national scholarly resource through collection, preservation, and dissemination. Um, we have a lot of objects that are, you know, people would call archival treasures. I personally think that just about everything we have is a treasure, but there are some that have a little more name recognition than others, um, like a handwritten copy of the New Colossus in Emma Lazarus's own handwriting. Uh, the poem that I've joked over the years is probably the one poem that every American child learns at some point in school. Um, and we do have an original of that, and it is quite beautiful. But what I think is probably more important for what we're going to talk about today is we also have an enormous amount of records from Jewish organizations, communal philanthropic, um, which are great use to genealogists because of the type of work that they do. And since we have been collecting for so long, we have a lot of these collections that go back um, a substantial amount of time. Um, so, and but we also have important other collections, um, education, philanthropy. Oh, my sound is not coming up good. Hold on, let me see if I can improve that, the, turn myself up, is that any better? Yeah, it's muffled, unfortunately, because the HVAC is blowing in my office and I've tried to get them to shut it off. And it's gone down a bit, but it's not. Uh, so I'm sorry, we'll try and, and work on it a bit uh, here, but unfortunately it's just, sadly, um, it's it's not gonna be great. Um, do you wanna move to the next slide, Moria? Okay, so out of all of the things that we have here, I'm really gonna, we're gonna talk about four, uh, sort of major types of records that um, that the AJHS holds that would be of use to genealogists. The first of which are the records of Jewish orphanages and orphan asylums. Um, this is a record from the Hebrew Orphan Asylum of the city of New York, but we have at least eight to 10 other orphan asylum records in addition to this one, um, some of which have digitized material, some of which sadly do not. And, um, and I say that because while you're looking through the finding aids for these things, you may notice that discrepancy. And the reason why has to do with the privacy restrictions that were initially put on these types of records. And so at the time that we were aggressively digitizing them, we could only go up to a certain time period, uh, which essentially was everything before 1940, okay? Um, we absolutely intend to digitize more, um, but, I just wanted to explain that, um, that it wasn't uh, wasn't an omission of um, sort of lack of merit or lack of funding. It was because of the privacy restrictions that were put on these types of materials um, upon donation. Um, but there's also a lot of other material, particularly from Hebrew Orphan Asylum, that has been digitized, which are photographs. And there's an enormous amount of photographs from the Hebrew Orphan Asylum, which are available digitally, which are also um, very, very interesting. Um, and yes, and we, oh, by the way, uh, panelists that are in the chat, you're accidentally only going to hosts and panelists, it looks like. So um, just so you know, because I made that mistake myself. So then this slide here um, also represents not just the archival materials that we have, but AJHS also has a substantial library. We have 50, at least 50,000 books that also support the archival uh, collections that we hold, and that includes the genealogical ones. So for example, these are books that were written from uh, alumni of the orphan asylums, scholarly and uh, you know, sort of social science 
analyses of the orphan asylums, et cetera. So there's really a lot to pull from in terms of looking through these materials. And at this point in time, um, the bulk of it is not covered under any restrictions because most of the orphan asylums started to get phased out uh, like mid 20th century. And so um, all of the latest materials are really about to come up against the end of that restriction period, just so you're aware. However, we, um, we routinely lift restrictions for genealogists. Uh, if you're coming to research your own family, that is normally an exception to those type of restrictions. We can move to the next one. Um, another area of collecting that AJHS has been extremely invested in over the years is documenting the wartime service of, um, of the American Jewish population. Um, and a great amount of this information is held in this, what I would call this constellation of collections that were created by the National Jewish Welfare Board. Um, all of their collections combined are the second largest collection at AJHS. Uh, clocking in somewhere about 1,800 linear feet, which is an enormous amount of material. And about half of that, I would say, is related specifically to wartime service. So what this is here, these are cards that were collected by the National Jewish Welfare Board to document um, American soldiers and sailors in World War II. Um, this also is one of the first uses, just a little nerdy aside, of IBM punch card type technology to aggregate large data sets um, for statistical analysis. So this is one of the first times they're trying this out in the 40s and into the 50s. All of these were digitized and are available via Ancestry. Um, and of course, we do hold the physical ones here. Um, however, I also feel obligated to point out this is by no means complete. We have, I believe, around 275,000, 300, 100,000 cards, but we know there was at least 500,000 American Jews who fought in World War II. So this is by no means everybody, um, but they can be extremely informative for genealogists because a lot of service records for American GIs were lost in the large fire at the National Archives in the early 1970s. And NJWB was also tracking things like awards. Did you get a Purple Heart? Did you get a Bronze Star? Um, a lot of these different awards. So for those of you who have families who did have wartime service during the Second World War, these can be a really wonderful source of information for you. For some of these cards, we also have additional files, um, but I don't want to get your hopes up because the files, we probably only have files, we don't have files for a lot of them. Um, it really depended on which families sent in information to the NJWB newspaper accounts of People say winning a purple heart, that kind of thing. But if you have questions about it, you can feel free to email us at AJHS um, or the people in the Genealogy Institute, and we can look and see if there's a file um, for you. Um, NJWB also had an enormous amount of information on chaplains. So if there's any of you that had chaplains in your family, uh, we, are, we have an enormous amount of information, including detailed files on the chaplains that are also um, very interesting to those who are researching that. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Okay, and the next two are kind of related, um, which are the Baron de Hirsch collection, which is um, a very large collection as well, um, which has been heavily used by genealogists over the years. But sadly, um, the collection itself is um, physically in very, very poor shape. And so we got microfilmed, and as Maury and JD will attest to, uh, shall we say the microfilms, um, the quality is not always say, optimal, um, especially not at this point when they've been used for about 20 years. But Baron de Hirsch is interesting for genealogists because of their trade schools, where they uh, trained people to work in various industries, uh, skilled labor, agriculture. You can see this is industrial. It's a sheet metal making class. Um, but they also help to sponsor various agricultural colonies as well. And so it gives you a sense of sort of what new immigrants were doing, the trades they were learning, and how they were migrating across the country. However, I have some very good news about the Baron de Hirsch collection, which is that we are currently in year one of a very large three-year grant of ourselves and our wonderful colleagues at the Center for Jewish History to digitize the entire collection, everything 
the trade school records, the agricultural colony information, you name it. Um, so right now the collection is closed because of this large project, but in three years, all of it, every single piece of paper will be freely available online through the portal um, that uh, Moria has already showed you. So that is very exciting. So uh, I, it'll take a little while, but uh, be patient with us and, and we're gonna get there and then everyone will have access to this in perpetuity. The next one. And then the industrial removal office, which was given to AJHS at the same time as Baron de Hirsch, uh, but eventually separated out into two separate collections. And the IRO is important because what it shows is um, not immigration per se, but migration, how people are moving and migrating across the country uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And this is incredibly important because this is how you know, we end up with thriving Jewish communities in some places where you may not think that would you know, be possible. Uh, places like Galveston, um, where there was where it still is. Um, you know, because that was a port city that they were routing people in um, rather than New York. And so what they're trying to do, the IRO, is move people out of the Northeast, right? So that's when you start to see a more large scale migration of people all over the country. And so the IRO has the records of what they call these removals. Um, some parts of IRO have been um, digitized. Um, there's a few boxes and folders. Um, and Maura and JD will also go through some of the ways that you can search some of these collections. Um, but this is a collection that I, I personally think we need to digitize more of because it's it's incredibly interesting and has an enormous amount of detail about Jewish life, uh, particularly in the Midwest um, and some places that we you know are a little are a bit perhaps understudied and underdocumented. So um, is that the last one for HHS? Ah, and then here uh, these are the the genealogy research guides, which were all created by Moria, JD, uh, the various people in uh, the genealogy department that show you how to search some of these AJHS specific collections, but the genealogy guides are not limited to AJHS. And that's what Moria and JD are going to get into right now. Okay. Yes. Okay, hello everyone. So um, I'd like to share with you some of the exciting resources that are specific to one of the other partners in the building, Evo, but um, certainly can be relevant to um, your research. I saw someone in the chat um, I asked about shtetls. Um, we have on uh, our instructional video series, Genealogy Coffee Break, on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, a video about uh, finding your ancestors' town um, and finding towns on maps. So one of the really great resources that uh, has been put together by staff in our building is the YIVO Thousand thousand towns. Um, usually the quickest way is just Google evil thousand towns with the numeral one triple zero. Um, and it has usually unindexed, but very interesting black and white photos organized by a particular town name. So um, maybe not for an individual uh, identification of a person in the photo, but if you want to see um, people at work, some of the professions, what the synagogue looked like, um, the cemetery, um, this aftermath of pogroms, you can find um, those and other types of photos for free on this online database, Evo Thousand Towns. Um, I won't get into it now, but know also and ask us a question either here or by email if you have other questions specific to um, pre-immigration Eastern European resources. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, on 
the the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society is a great resource that um, intersects with the family history research of uh, a lot of people. Uh, it's still in existence today. Hyas is still helping immigrants uh, now from Ukraine. Unfortunately, most recently, um, and other places where there are refugee crisis crises. Um, so the website there there is a website that is under renovation at the moment, but it will be back up soon. Where you can just type in a a name in these parameters and see um, the the arrival or the sponsorship card specific to the person you're researching. Um, you, maybe I'm just going to butt in for one second here to explain. Sorry. So the the highest collection is split between two partners. Yivo has the first fifty years, and AJHS has the second fifty years. The AJHS website for those who may have visited it, recently underwent a large renovation and not all of the pages have migrated yet. So the, the screenshot that JD just showed where you could search for a case file is currently being rebuilt. Uh, it turns out it was much more complicated than we realized to migrate a huge database with hundreds of thousands of names. Um, but it is underway along with the other pages that we created for the highest collection which give things like a timeline of highest and various things. But so it can be a little confusing, but no, all highest materials are in the same building. The question is just where. Yeah, and, and that nice database page um, has a, a pretty easy to follow choice, uh, this time range or that time range. Uh, since Hyas is still in existence, you can also write to Hyas directly. Um, Shirley Postnikov is our friend and archivist at Hyas who comes here from time to time, and she's very receptive and accessible. Um, if if uh, if you don't find what you're looking for online and you want to write to Hyas directly, um, okay. Next, moving on. Um, this is what the, the, the database looks like when you uh, type in a name and you get a really cool PDF of the card uh, itself that can include um, more information. Usually it's filed by the, the head of the family unit, um, but you might find more information about other family members and their immigration process. Um, so I saw in the Q&A already at least one Lanzmannschaften question. So uh, for those of you out there who have Lanzmannschaften members in your uh, ancestry, Lanzmannschaft is the Yiddish word for the uh, communal immigrant aid organization from of of immigrants from a particular town so especially in the days in america before social security and uh, safety nets uh, the way that people received benef widow benefits to support a family after um, the husband died or to um, have funds available for burial things like that uh, were through these Landsmannschaft organizations. Um, most of them are no longer in existence. There are still some in existence in Europe um, that, that need, but it can be really interesting to research, especially if you think your parents or grandparents were on the administrative boards then um, you might find information directly pertaining to your relatives. Otherwise, it's really interesting to see what the Landsmannschaft were up to in America. It's always a really good clue. If you visit a cemetery, uh, take a picture of the headstone of the person you're researching. So you get the Hebrew name and 
the father's Hebrew name and check on the, on the cemetery map or in, look for an arch or a gate or some sort of sign that says this is the, um, you know, uh, Warsaw or Landsmannschaft section of the cemetery, then it gives you a clue uh, or a confirmation about where that immigrant ancestor came from. Um, eventually, these will be digitized also, but in the meantime, you can make an appointment and come see them here in the reading room. Um, I, I typed into the Q&A already, but to um, be clear about it, if you go to genealogy.cjh.org, on the upper right-hand corner of that bar, under resources, you can follow that link, Evo Landsmannschaft and Collection, and you see this uh, list. Then an easy way is just do a control F search and start typing um, Warsaw or uh, Stolen is the example here in the screenshot, if that's a town you're researching, and you can see what uh, collections are here in the building. Really what we have here is is still a drop in the bucket, but um, if we have it, you can come see it. Okay, so um, talking about German language records uh, in the catalog, uh, the, the partner that uh, organizes the German language collections has really done a tremendous amount of work in making as much as possible uh, at least 80% or more of their collections accessible online um, through the catalog, through internet archive. So um, certainly if you are a Jewish American with ancestors who came from Germany or Austria, Check uh, our catalog first uh, before you come in, and it's very possible that family trees, uh, biographies, uh, memoirs, photographs will be immediately accessible to you through the catalog online. Um, moving on, uh, one of the well known. Uh, Jewish American uh, German language newspapers, Aufbau, has been digitized, uh, like I mentioned, through Internet Archive. You can access it directly um, at that archive.org link. Um, so you can search if uh, you wanted to read about a particular town or you wanted to search through people, uh, family members looking for Un unknown fate um, individuals from their family, you can search uh, Aufbau through the Internet Archive as well as through um, the card catalog on Ancestry.com. So that's a great resource. Um, among others, we have um, interviews with refugees, um, through, through this collection, um, other collections that you can access uh, through our computers on site also include Holocaust survivor testimonies about a particular town. So uh, if you have a Holocaust survivor in your family and you want to hear other testimonies from other people from that same town, um, we have a, a resources to help you do that. Um, moving on to the Sephardi and uh, Mizrahi diaspora. Um, we have in the Genealogy Institute a section of reference books uh, that's very popular, the surname dictionaries about the etymologies of last names. Um, at least up until the 17, mid 1800s, most Jews did not have fixed last names. It wasn't part of our uh, cultural tradition, like, uh, you know, the, the Queen of England and the Windsor family, you can trace back in family trees hundreds of years, 
um, Jews like you can you can understand from Jewish tombstones went by so and so son of or daughter of so and so until these empires where we were living decreed um, Jews have to create and use last names so that we can tax you draft you um, keep you in census records so among those surname dictionaries for Russian Empire Poland Germany, Galicia, we have also for the uh, Sephardic diaspora. Um, and a lot of really interesting uh, American collection, American organizational collections like the Sephardic Brotherhood, um, where you can read through in English mostly and some in Ladino or Hebrew or other languages, records of what that community's immigrant life was like here in New York. Um, so you never know. Uh, you just uh, can identify some organizations in your family's past that may have helped your family immigrate or settle or learn English um, and come and visit us and see if uh, there's any connection either for you to understand the context um, or if you're lucky to to find that exact name of the ancestor here in the records so i'll i'll finish my spiel there and um, we'll move on to the next section of a presentation which i i think is already at the q a if i'm correct ellen yeah, so really well we have that to 12 minutes for questions. So, so uh, I'm keeping an eye. Yeah, okay. I've, I've got the questions. I've been watching the chat and the Q&A. So I have picked out a few and we're going to sort of address what we can. Um, I just want to say that there are a number of questions in the Q&A and chat that are not relevant to the purview of this topic. We specifically wanted to focus on American Jews at the CGS, at the Center for Jewish History. Um, so some of you were asking some very introductory questions about where to find vital records, uh, how to follow up on passenger manifests, how to navigate ancestry.com. These are all different um, questions for other lectures. So we're going to try to stay focused because we don't have a lot of time and either answer questions directly related to what the panelists have mentioned today or that we think they may be able to answer further. So I uh, dismissed several of these more general intro questions into the dismissed Q&A. Please don't be insulted. We just can't get to 100 questions but I left those that may have relevance. So the very first one, I'm not sure what it even is, but Vivian asked was, were Ein Mal War digitized? Um, I'm not sure what this is or that any of you mentioned this. Is this a collection that you hold at CJH anywhere? Moria, do you know, JD? Um, if we do hold it, it would be at the Leo Beck Institute. And I'm not sure that it's relevant to the subject of um, today's presentation, but you're welcome to reach out to our uh, reading room. Uh, I'll, I'll put that in the uh, chat. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Okay, we're going to keep going because we got to fire through these. A lot of interest for the IRO industrial um, removal office records. Uh, the question is, did the re IRO record only um, include removals from New York to other parts of the country? Um, honestly, I am not entirely sure of the answer to that, but I will say this: the record of the removals goes from 1899 to 1922. And so when you think about just where people are coming into, New York City is most likely the primary part. Um, but there's also a piece that's, that's related to the IRO, which is um, the Galveston uh, information, which is a separate collection, but is... Um, documenting a similar uh, migration pattern. So um, I would say, yeah, it, it really documents where people are going from large port cities because that was 
you know, that was the primary mode of uh, getting from Europe to here during the period of time that's covered. And so, Melanie, you are saying it includes ports other than New York incoming people. I believe so. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Karen Wyman asks, does will the Baron de Hirsch collection also include records for Clara de Hirsch Home for Immigrant Women? Grandmother was sent there, 1909. I'd love to be able to access those records. If it's in the collection, it will all be digitized. Um, it's a very large collection. It's 200 boxes. So I am not sure how much material we have on that particular uh, initiative by the de Hirsch Fund which was a large philanthropic fund that funded a lot of different things, not just the trade schools and agricultural colonies and not just in the United States. Um, but I will check and uh, my email, I'll put my email in the chat. So also I, I saw a bunch of people who wanted in more information about World War II stuff. I'm gonna put my email in the chat and you can just email me directly about that. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Moria, could you please put the website to search off bow? Um, someone said they weren't fast enough to catch it. Is that the Alex Kalsreth Jersig site? Yes, that's correct. Okay, we'll put that in the chat for you. I think you can also search through it, search it on Jewish Gen. Am I correct? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. okay. I'm not a Jersig expert. Avrami, if you're if you which, know quickly, yes or no. Which one? Or which one did you want to say? Um, the, uh, sorry, the uh Alf Alfbau announcements. Yes, I'll post a um a link in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. Um okay, questions about testimonies for concentration camp is the type we're going to dismiss, not in the scope of this lecture. Um, someone would be grateful to see again a demonstration for using a finding aid for a collection of interests found in a search. Is that something you have perhaps in another recording on your YouTube channel, Moria? Uh, yes. If you go to the Center for Jewish History's YouTube channel or Facebook page, you can find a video in our Genealogy Coffee Break series that's all about how to uh, search for an archival collection and navigate through the uh, finding aid for, for a particular collection. Okay, great. Uh, Susan asks, is a membership required to access records? The answer is no, this is a public website and search. Um, do most of your resources focus on the New York City area or also elsewhere, including New England? Um, so AJHS, um, we focus on the American Jewish experience. So that is the entire United States. And it also includes the Caribbean as well as South America, although not as comprehensively as I would like, but those are collecting areas. An enormous amount of our stuff does come from New York City simply because that is where we have been located, um, you know, for the last 20 years. And, um, you know, because that's also where a lot of the organizations who donated their records have been have been located, but that is um, that is not deliberate in any way. Um, we do document the entire um, American Jewish experience. So, great, thank you. Um, I had a couple from the chat quickly. Ayana asks, "Is there any information about Yemenite Jews who immigrated to New York during the 1920s, other than what's on other commercial websites?" Does the American Sephardi um, Foundation Federation records have anything Yemenite in nature that you're aware of? Uh, I would recommend just go to search.cjh.org and put in the search term Yemen. Um, as far as I know, uh, we may have general information. Um, Yemen wasn't included in the Jewish Sephardi Brotherhood, for example. That was just the Balkans. But um, off the top of my head, the short answer is no. I'm not aware of any archival collection, but we certainly have background information and books um, and maybe general information about um, the Yemeni community. Wonderful. Thank you, JD. Um, somebody mentions, Moria, that they tried to get on the historical synagogue map 
And although the list of synagogues appears, the map was not populated. Is this possibly an operating system issue? And you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, great question. Um, it may be a temporary glitch. I will certainly look into that and make sure it's up and running again as soon as possible. Okay, um, great. It's not, yeah, it's not a um, it's not a permanent malfunction. Okay, great. Avrami, uh, can I hand it over to you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm just looking through. Um, Melanie and Maria on JD, if you see any that you wanted to um, to answer quickly in the next uh, two minutes, maybe that's easier if you want to just pull one out. There's Actually, a bunch in the Q&A. Yeah, I've seen one. I think there was in the chat because we, we talked, we threw the name around, but then we didn't explain what it was. Somebody asked, what's United Service for New Americans? Um, USMA is... Um, like HIAS, it's an organization that helped facilitate immigration and actually was later became a part of HIAS. So HIAS is currently sort of the successor organization for USMA. And I might add um, AJHS has the records of USMA and um, some of which have been digitized through a clear grant along with a lot of the highest records. So even though the database of cards is not operational right now, there's an enormous amount of digitized material in the highest collection um, and USNA that all focuses on, um, on the immigration experience. So. There was a great question about uh, Landsmannschaften records and whether they are in English. Um, the vast majority of them are uh, actually largely in Yiddish. Um, depends on what time period you're looking at though. It, uh, if you're looking at records from, let's say the late 1800s, early 1900s, those are most likely to be in Yiddish and uh, Further on in the 20th century, they will uh, are more likely to be in English. I th I think that's all of the questions that we had our eye on. Uh, uh, from I know some people are having technical issues about saving the chat, or if you will save the chat for them. Okay. Um, well, thank you, thank you, JD. Um, so I think we'll we'll wrap it up. And in terms of the chat. Um, you can just do a control A if, if anybody wants to. We're not going to send out the chat, but right before we wrap up in the next minute, if you want to do a control A and control all and copy and paste, uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, I'd like to thank Ellen and all of our panelists for this uh, very informative presentation. There's so many resources that are available, and uh, thank you for outlining this uh, for our audience, um, which was uh, spread throughout the world, and we thank you all for participating today. Um, I hope that you will join us for future events. Our next, our next uh, webinar will actually continue this series of uh, research in the United States, and that will take place on uh, November 2nd. The topic is American Synagogue Records as a Genealogy Resource. Um, we'll have Dana Herman, Mary Silverstein, Shula Berger, Ellen, uh, Ellen Coet. Um, we're gonna send out a registration link uh, when we send out the link to the uh, video that's been posted on our YouTube channel. So please take a look and register early. And thank you again for joining. And if you have any questions, please let us know anytime by emailing support at jewishgen.org. Thanks to you again. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.